Thanks very much for the invitation to come and talk about some research that I've been doing with Andy Pike at the back and John Tomney from Bartlett School of Planning at uh, UCL. Uh, it's been a fantastic four and a half years working with many good people. So we're going to give you a snippet, hopefully, of some of the research we've been doing during that time. So just a reminder to kind of look at what it was we were trying to sort of examine uh, and sort of ask, pose in terms of research questions and this sort of four here in the main that we set ourselves initially. Uh, four and a half years ago, uh, looking at particular regulation and governance arrangements for infrastructure funding and financing, and where they existed at regional, local and urban scales. What type of uh, new and emerging models of infrastructure funding and financing were being developed? Who were the actors involved in this, uh, in terms of uh, uh, regulation and governance? And how does the kind of governance, funding and financing of local infrastructure influence and shape local regional development, given that that's a particular interest of ours within Kurds. So we kind of looked at, uh, in terms of putting together an analytical framework, uh, examine the changing nature of infrastructure as a kind of a public good through into shaping cities and urban environments. Clearly in the post-global financial crisis era, infrastructure is uh, gaining importance, particularly as a means to stimulate uh, stagnant growth. Uh, in terms of private sector, it's been seen increasingly as an alternative investment class. And also you've seen in particular cities across the world uh, a crisis, if you like, of infrastructure overload, but also historic underinvestment in that infrastructure. And since the global financial crisis and fiscal consolidation, uh, states, uh, both nationally, locally and regionally, have sought to restructure, they've implemented austerity measures and fiscal consolidation. So that had to play a part in our thinking about how infrastructure is funded and financed, governed and planned. And that poses some questions about how it is actually funded and financed, and clearly that was an element of the research for us, as was the whole question about governance and investment, and particularly, as I said earlier, our interest within Kurds, what does this mean for local regional development policy? So I won't go through this in detail, but you'll see it, I think, in the poster uh, that's at the back of the room, or in the other room there. There are a number of different funding and financing practices, and when we kind of looked at this, we clearly had to make a distinction between funding and financing, uh, and you can see here from the slide here, you've got some established, tried and tested measures through, measures through uh, taxes and fees, through grants, through into more kind of innovative kind of measures such as asset leverage and leasing mechanisms. And then through our kind of research and work and our empirical work, we began to draw together a, a framework for kind of thinking about these things in more detail, and particularly around whether there was a shift from more traditional approaches to funding and financing and governance of infrastructure to more kind of emergent and new approaches. And this just sets out some of our thoughts and thinking, particularly around whether there was a difference and shift in emphasis on timescales, so initially more shorter timescales to much more longer timescales now, whether this was broadening out in terms of the geography and the spatial kind of scope of infrastructure funding and financing from perhaps single local authority areas to more functional economic areas, whether this was leading from a shift towards uh, grant-based funding to more kind of investment-led funding and in particular around whether in the context of decentralisation within the UK and particularly England whether we were seeing a more devolved approach to infrastructure funding or financing which Richard alluded to in his opening remarks. So through some two particular empirical kind of studies that we've done, one around the UK city deals and this map here just gives you an illustration of those deal areas. Uh, the different shadings are uh, the different waves as we called it, so the orange, uh, sorry, the green sort of waves is the first wave of kind of core city metropolitan areas, and then through into kind of orange of the smaller kind of key city areas, and then you began to see within Wales and Scotland, within devolved territories, an interest in city deals, and they began to develop and agree their own arrangements there. So our interest was primarily within how infrastructure is being funded or financed within the city deals, but also there were some governance questions there as well because these were very different kind of uh, uh, initiatives and arrangements that were being rolled out. What was quite apparent through the research that we did was the kind of unevenness when it came to kind of resources that were being put into infrastructure uh, through the city deals, the opaque at times uh, arrangements and negotiations that were taking place between different actors between local and regional actors and national governments, both UK and devolved territories when it came to Scotland and Wales. And this was resulting in some quite marked differences when it came to investment per capita. 
in infrastructure. And you can see here from this slide the difference between, say, the Cardiff capital region and Glasgow, which was very heavily infrastructure orientated through to Sunderland and the northeast, which received some kind of funding for uh, planning and remedial kind of work for uh, a new investment park on the outskirts of Sunderland. So these are quite uneven in terms of their processes and outcomes going forward. Clearly, uh, others have mentioned austerity that's played a part in kind of local government, thinking about how it can be both, uh, if you like, entrepreneurial and managerial when it comes to uh, managing its estate, investing in infrastructure. And the reductions here, uh, you can see from a National Audit Office uh, slide, and they're doing another survey and another study of this in the next few weeks, show how local government has had significant reductions in its budget, which has meant that local government has had to think differently about how it uses its assets, where it sources its funding and financing from. But we would argue that's within a quite constrained set of environments when it comes to how public investment and taxation is raised across different parts of the UK. Through some work we did in, in London, uh, looking at TfL uh, and its transport uh, governance and funding and financing arrangements, what was apparent as well was the kind of unevenness between the resources that were going to London and London's ability to assemble different funding and financing packages whereby other places within the UK couldn't necessarily do that. They didn't have the scale or they didn't have national government backing or the markets wasn't there. And you can see here from uh, some treasury analysis of uh, uh, a public expenditure on transport how London per capita receives quite significant uh, higher figures of investment than uh, other regions. But within the context of uh, the UK, and particularly England, there are constraints, if you like, in terms of the highly centralised state which exists when it comes to raising uh, finance and funding. Uh, but even London, uh, compared to some of its global city region competitors, is quite constrained here. And again, Rich showed the, the slide from uh, Enid Slack's work, uh, which shows how London raises relatively few, fewer municipal taxes compared to other cities uh, elsewhere. But when we uh, looked at London, what was quite apparent was the ability of London both to be kind of entrepreneurial and to be managerial. So the ability to use its markets to become a property developer, as TfL is trying to do, uh, but at the same time use the national government balance sheet to underwrite some of its loans to uh, develop a funding and financing package for the Northern Line extension, which is probably quite unique within the country and would we would suggest that other places would uh, find this very difficult to uh, uh, do something similar on this scale. So being very quickly, kind of in terms of our findings and our sort of conclusions, and uh, we're sort of uh, you know, rolling these forward in terms of our publications, we would argue that the local state, local government, is being compelled to be entrepreneurial, but this is unfolding in very uneven ways that austerity and fiscal stress are forcing the local state to engage both in entrepreneurial but also managerial approaches. So TfL, for example, trying to gain greater control over devolved transport services within London would be an example of, of managerial approaches. But you've got a very centralised UK state which is kind of articulated and putting constraints on different kind of managerial and also financialization processes within the UK. And we would argue through our work in London that there is a biased kind of infrastructure narrative that prioritises uh, sort of London. But the very fact that you're getting these marked disparities when it comes to infrastructure provision really does kind of at times undermine attempts to spatially rebalance the UK economy, which is quite problematic for a government at a national and regional local level. So there's more details of uh, our research within the publications that we've uh, 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 had on the papers, and you can see them, some of these here, particularly on the London and the City Deals work. And engagement and impact has been an important part of the process as well over the last four and a half years, so responding to National Infrastructure Commission uh, uh, inquiries or parliamentary inquiries, and some work that Andy and I did in terms of our City Deals work was to give evidence in person to the UK uh, Parliament, but also the Scottish Parliament as well. And just finally, just a personal note, I'd like to thank uh, Andy, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with him, uh, absolutely fantastic, and also the rest of the I-Bill team. So, happy to take any questions. Yeah. So, time for a couple of quick questions for Peter, is there anybody? Yes, sir. Um, I'm Zach Wilcox from Arab. Um, given the focus of uh, devolving business rates as kind of the main kind of uh, 
uh, funding devolution to local authorities, especially around city deals. Do you think that's the right mechanism for infrastructure funding and finance, or should we be looking to another area? Um, I, I, I think if I was a local government finance officer, having to deal with the business rate system, uh, you probably would be you know, pulling your hair out. So it's probably, it almost feels, uh, Zach, that there's been a, uh, the government might say an opportunity passed to local authorities, but actually the system is highly uh, problematic, I think. So we, that's why you're probably seeing, you know, we need to look elsewhere. There are also clearly some redistributional equity sort of issues as well, isn't there, from, from business rates. But I think, you know, um, uh, whether the, you know, there are other taxes that could be devolved is probably a very good point, and it probably, it probably is as well. And I can see the core cities in London looking for those. Mike Good for the Smith University of Birmingham. Thanks, Peter. Um, when you gave the illustration of the Northern Line extension, uh, you then said, we couldn't replicate this, or it'd be very hard to replicate such a funding package outside of London. Yet we understand from Richard in the introduction, we need to look at lots more of local, small scale infrastructure investments. So do we need the same type of funding mechanisms as London, or do we need uh, more appropriate funding mechanisms? Okay, um, I, I think, the London model, it seems, the Northern Line extension is, a, a, is, a, is, is an interesting one and one would seem to be quite uh, particular to London given its context. And that particular example of Northern Line extension is a, a development kind of opportunity in, in a way. I think the, the extension is around four, four miles, uh, so it's not, not major and significant. I think what we're, we're sort of saying is the ability of, of London to say, look, to government, we need some form of investment, and whether it's through you underwriting borrowing or it's through you giving us maybe more fiscal uh, devolution to enable this to kind of happen, but also we're bringing in sovereign wealth fund, like the Malaysian sovereign wealth fund that's under underwriting some of this sort of investment in Northern Line Extension Nine Elms, means that there are a very set of unique circumstances that given London's dominance of the UK economy, you couldn't necessarily see elsewhere, but there may be some lessons from, from that in terms of the assembling of a funding and financing package that could be done at a kind of smaller, smaller scale. But I think our argument would be that, that that's quite, you know, that's quite sort of unique in, in a way, but, but maybe there are things that we could take and lessons for elsewhere. Um, and, and so, yeah, good question. <laughs>